Hey gang, what's going on? Juan back here once again with another Lucha Underground review. This time I'll be talking about episode two of the second season. Before I do that, I do want to thank everybody that left a comment on the previous video letting me know that you do want to hear some Lucha Underground reviews every now and then. Now, I can't promise that I'll be doing them on a weekly basis, but I will be providing them whenever it is I can. So with that being said, I want to get immediately to my overall impressions of the episode, I thought it was a good, solid second episode for the second season. I'm not going to say it is a much watch episode. It did not have the initial impression that the first episode of the second season did, but there were some notable things. And as per tradition here, I have my notes that I wrote throughout the show. Keep in mind, I am still familiarizing myself with the show. So every now and then I'll forget some names. So I got to make sure to write those things down, make sure I don't forget anything. So let's get right down to it. The show kicks off with a little bit more highlights into what happened on the first season regarding Ultima Lucha, the Mac, all these uh, characters that you are continuously being introduced more or, or in, getting, getting back, I should say, in the second season. And we end with Dario Cueto and what happened in the previous episode where there's this thing or apparently there's a different temple or something like that. We're still not sure what's going to happen. We didn't get any more details about that. But I guess it's also understandable that we can't get every single thing in one episode and then, you know, you figure out everything in the other one. They got to leave a little something special, right? They can't just give it off right off the bat. Now, the next scene, we have Prince Puma working out the former Lucha Underground champion, remembering some of the things that happened with Mil Muertes in the first season that led to his title loss. And now we have Pentagon Jr. coming into the scene. Apparently, they have a tag team match in the episode's main event against the Disciples of Death. Now, these two guys don't get along too well. They have a little bit of a brawl, not really anything too serious that goes on backstage. I'm not a huge fan, I'll be honest, of the choreographed fights that they have backstage. There's a reason that a lot of movies with fight scenes take so long to record, and it's because in order to make it look real, it takes time. And I think you can sort of tell they're trying to make it look pretty, but it ends up looking a little too slow for me. So even though I love the cinematic style that all these backstage segments have, I could do a little bit less with this. But compared to the overall enjoyment that I have with these episodes in Lucha Underground as a whole, I'm willing to give that a pass. So this segment ends with both of them just sort of being okay. They're going to be in the tag match, but you do know there's some tension between them. Match one, Johnny Mundo versus Kill Shot. Now, Johnny Mundo, for those who don't know, is the former uh, Johnny Nitro, John Morrison, John Hennigan in the WWE, former Tough Enough contestant. This guy has been wrestling for quite a long time and was initiated into the WWE as part of Tough Enough, then was one half of uh, a tag team with The Miz. This guy has really just transformed his entire career. He was a staple in the first season of Lucha Underground. I did have a chance to watch a couple of his matches. He battles Killshot, and this is my first time watching this guy wrestle. Overall, not a lot to say that I haven't said or will probably see about the other matches. These are really athletic battles. There's a reason it's called Lucha Underground, and it's because of the Lucha style. So you get to see a lot of high flying. Not too much selling goes on in into any of these matches. And as I mentioned in my episode one review, anybody going into WWE and then transitioning to Lucha Underground may have a little bit of trouble with that. But keep in mind, different strokes for different folks. This is a different show and treated as such. Now, one thing I did forget is that Johnny Mundo is now a heel, no longer a babyface, and he played that pretty well in this match. There were three notable sequences that I really enjoyed, and they were basically in the conclusion. There was at one point where Killshot had Johnny Mundo in the corner. He delivered a super kick while Johnny Mundo was sort of the in, in the shattered dreams position with his legs just above the different ropes. He gets super kicked, and then, bam, he gets DDT'd. 450, he kicks out. This goes back to the whole not a lot of selling thing here in Lucha Underground because in WWE, a guy may be dead unless he's John Cena or something. Although, WWE has changed a little bit more 
they sell less than before, but that's not the point here. Now, at uh, one part, the referee did get a small bump, which led to Johnny Mundo seizing the opportunity, delivering a low blow, and then we got the end of the world, the former starship pain, the uh, split-legged moonsault, basically. I, I don't know what I, I tried doing here. That that didn't work too well. Anyway, he won the match. It was a good match. And then afterwards, we have Cage come out. This is another guy that a lot of people love in the independent wrestling scene. I honestly haven't had too much of a chance to watch him. He was on a podcast episode, I believe, with Cole Cabana. It was something a long while back, and I have seen some matches, and I can tell this guy is athletic, although huge. You'll look at him, and this guy's probably bigger than a Bobby Lashley or something. This guy's a freak of nature, and I am curious and interested into seeing what these two are going to do. In this whole process, like the previous episode, Mil Muertes, the Lucha Underground champion, was not necessarily at ringside, but he was up there. You know, he was in the temple overwatching all of this. Johnny Mundo made a reference to him. Everybody knows he's in there. Everybody wants a shot at the champion. Up next is probably my favorite segment of the show because it was so different. We're treated to a backstage uh, promo where I really should say a movie scene, basically, with Sexy Star. She was in the very first episode of Lucha Underground, I believe, and she's a female competitor that is handcuffed. She looks like she's been bruised or something like that. This is the most overly cinematic scene I've seen in Lucha Underground so far. And then we see Marty the Moth come into the screen. I saw this guy uh, have a couple of matches. I believe he was an Ultima Lucha. I watched something on their YouTube channel which featured him. He does this whole Moth thing, which... I didn't think too much of, honestly, when I saw him in the ring, I thought, cool, but this whole Ma thing, I'm not a huge fan of. He, apparently, he was also in Tough Enough, so a lot of Tough Enough guys with Evil Ease, Son of Havoc, etc., doing really well in Lucha Underground, but going back to this here, I didn't know that he kidnapped her. I'm not sure what happened there, but I mean, you guys can fill me in. I do need to research that a little bit more, but she is kidnapped, and then... Marty the Moth channels this Joker light type thing, and I like it. He has, at one point, this really high-pitched laugh that almost, he, he like squealed like, uh, when, like when you're going through puberty or something, but it worked so well because it was imperfect. It didn't feel like he was just stealing a page from Heath Ledger slash Joker in the Dark Knight movies. It felt like he was putting his own twist to it. He wasn't being overly creepy. He was being this... Just just crazy guy, a little bit psychotic. And I am curious as to what they're going to do with this. Or is she going to become manipulated by him? So she's going to become his valet? I'm really not sure because, once again, I haven't been too exposed to what Marty the Moth is all about. But I love the color correction. It's got this green uh, color throughout the whole scene. The music in the background, it's like horror theme, really mysterious. And it just sets the tone. And it reminds me why I am enjoying Lucha Underground, that even though this was not an amazing episode, as I said in the beginning, these little things remind me of the difference between something that the WWE can do and something that Lucha Underground can do. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but in this circumstance, it's cool to see a what-if scenario of what would happen if wrestling just became all-out cinematic and put your music, you know, your color correction on screen, treat it like a movie, this segment so far is the best example of that being put to effective use. Now, before we go to commercial break, I almost thought Baron Corbin was going to make a Lucha Underground debut. And I know I can't be the only person that thought that we're getting this a wolf character motorcycle doesn't leave a lot of room for imagination. I forgot this was a thing that was confirmed months ago, but the Dear Wolf, PJ Black, the former Justin Gabriel in the WWE is now part of Lucha Underground, and I thought to myself, cool, so when's this guy going to debut? Oh, after the commercial break? Why not? Go, go for it. Cool. Good for you, man. Good for you. This leads us to our second battle of the night, the Mac versus the Darewolf, PJ Black. Now, the Mac is somebody that I've also not been too exposed to. I saw that last season he did the stunner with the beer imitating Stone Cold by ringside. People love that. I am a fan of his style. He is a bigger wrestler, but like everybody else, the man is really athletic and that can go a long way. 
And another detail that I loved about this before the match even began is just the entrance. It's so not perfect in the world where wrestling companies think that the best entrances are, you know, when the light is just directly on the wrestler and everything looks all pretty and beautiful. PJ Black basically comes out to darkness. As a matter of fact, you see the name bar at one point, but you can't really even see him. He's going among the crowd, and you can't see him until he's right there on the top before going down the stairs. And I love that because even he looked like, oh, so this is the temple, man. This is this is something I can get used to. And it was enjoyable because anywhere else, you would just get so many lights, so many all of these things. And it reminds me why I love the temple so much. It's dirty it, it, it looks like it would smell horrible but you would just have a great time in there getting to the match itself mac was able to portray that athleticism i mentioned at one point he does a samoan drop into a kip up into a moonsault and let's be honest at least in my case when you see a guy that's about to make his debut logically that is the guy that wins right well, no, Mac was actually the winner in this bout, and I loved how it happened. It was an out-of-nowhere thing. PJ Black was going to perform a springboard move. Mac gets him with the stunner. Bam! Momentum killer. The Mac is victorious. I am really looking forward to what they do with this afterwards, because in traditional wrestling, this would sort of unfold into a storyline between Mac and PJ Black. You know, I just came in, and you beat me. Now I got to beat you. I got to one-up you. Is that going to happen? I legitimately have no idea because I don't know how that format plays into Lucha Underground. But Darewolf, PJ Black is in here. Hopefully, he has a much better run than he did as a member of the core. Before we are treated to our tag team main event, we see a brand new vignette for a new female competitor called the Cobra Moon. Cobra with a K because the K just makes everything cool like it's 1999. Now... It is another choreographed thing. I'm assuming she's Hispanic or something. Her English was not all that great. Uh, she reminded me a lot of Sexy Star. Uh, she even said sexy at one point, which confused me a little bit. This goes back to sort of when WWE brands a word. If you hear that word, you associate it with a wrestler or a superstar. It seems like a, we, we've been brainwashed pretty much. Not saying that's a bad thing. If anything, I like that you can familiarize yourself word and wrestler and here she said pretty much every word and you couldn't see her too well so i was actually confused i was thinking so is sexy star released it was that handcuff thing a uh, thing of the past but no cobra moon debuts next week and that is all i can pretty much say about that now it is time to talk about the main event tag team match prince puma and pentagon jr versus the disciples of death not too much I can say that has not been said about previous bouts. This is where I sort of get a little bit on the negative side about Lucha Underground. I get that this is Lucha style. I get that everybody wants to get their moves over. But I didn't feel how the Disciples of Death were the bad guys. I get that they're aligned with Katrina and Mil Muertes and they have the skull masks. Understandable. But they wrestle like anybody else. They did a lot of spots where I just thought, well, cool. I mean, am I supposed to boo you? I don't really understand what's happening right now. I'm a little confused. Now, what ended up happening at the end of the match was that Pentagon Jr. got the pin after Puma just delivered a special maneuver on the corner. Now, these two guys did have a lot of moments where, you know, Pentagon Jr. Was he going to tag? Was he not? It's a, a traditional wrestling thing that it does play well here. It begs the question what's going to happen between these two guys now that both of them want to become Lucha Underground champion. Mil Muertes saw all of this after the match. We saw that Pentagon Jr. tried to betray Puma, uh, delivered a backcracker, and was about to break the arm, but Prince Puma was able to get out of it. Uh, two notes here. They obviously panned into Vampiro a lot, who was commentating ringside because of the match that he had with Pentagon Jr., Vampiro said that he loves Matt Stryker a lot. He loves Matt Stryker a lot. I mean, who who doesn't, right? Matt seems like a good guy to hang out with. Uh, basically, Matt was referring to everything that happened previously. Vampiro, was he going to stop this? Was he not? I think that it is an okay storyline to conclude the episode. Nothing too crazy. This is not something that we haven't seen in wrestling before. Very traditional, but I enjoy Pentagon Jr. This guy has presence. 
more than wrestling ability, more than any of those fancy words. This guy has something really special about him. Time out. Time out, Juan. Okay. So what happens when it's 5 44 a.m. in the morning, you're editing the video, and you realize you forgot to talk about the biggest thing that happened in the episode with Rey Mysterio. I guess by saying main event in the previous topic, I immediately thought that was the last thing, but then I completely forgot about that. Good thing I have my cup of coffee right now because I feel like a zombie, but talking about Rey Mysterio, the last segment gives you a sneak preview of something that could happen. You hear this very familiar voice right off the bat. I do know it's Rey Mysterio. He talks about uh, the legend or the destiny of El Dragón Azteca, making reference to a wrestler that we do see on camera. At first, he almost seems like he's unmasked because you only see like the, the power to the mouth and the jaw, etc. But then you get to see that wrestler on screen, and he's being talked to, spoken to by Rey Mysterio, who then the camera pans to, and he comes in forward like, yep, I am here. So I'm super looking forward to Rey Mysterio and Lucha Underground, easily the biggest reveal that we are probably going to be getting this season. Rey Mysterio has a lot of potential, somebody that... I know that we poke fun at you know, his knee, his injuries, and all of this, but the man is a legend, one of my favorite superstars of all time. Maybe not in the past couple of years, but this guy is somebody that I watched a lot growing up watching WCW. So I would love to know what you guys also thought about Rey Mysterio, but now let's go back to the other rest of the video. I would love to know what you guys thought about this episode. If you want to give it from a one to five, I'm not one to really provide numbers uh, and ratings and all that for a show, but I thought this was a good, not great, not awesome, not bad. It was a good episode. I would also like to know which was your favorite moment in this episode. As I mentioned, in my case, it was the whole Marty the Moth segment. And the final question, a lot of questions being asked here. Why do you think a lot of people just are not interested in Lucha Underground? I have my speculations, but I want to save that for the next video because I want to get some of your feedback before I really just delve into that. So I want to thank you for watching. This has been my review for the second episode of Lucha Underground's second season. I'm really happy that I'm devoting this time. As I mentioned before, I cannot guarantee that I'll be doing weekly reviews. But if you like this video, make sure to like, subscribe, join the family, check out Fight Night or Fantasy Wrestling League. We just posted a video about that. We have the WWE podcast available every single Tuesday night. So until next time, thank you for watching. And we will be back with tons more right here. I'll bite that.